So I am here with Samantha Gilbert and this is something I've been waiting for for two years in excitement. And now we finally have the chance to sit down and talk. Samantha is someone who's been working with Dr. Albert Mensa, which I know everyone who knows this post podcast is a big fan of, of Dr. Mensa. Um, and her take on the issues that autism moms and our children are dealing with is just so mind blowing. And I, th I just cannot wait to share that with you because many of the things that we deal with as moms are the same things that our children deal with, but our problems might express differently. So if you've ever felt depressed, anxious, um, struggled with eating or disordered eating, weight gain, um, this diet culture and extremist way of eating and breaking your metabolism and feeling like, okay, I'm too broken to be fixed. I just want to tell you that this woman will bring you hope and personal experience of how we can actually heal from those things. And also we're gonna talk about the missing links in the diet culture, in functional medicine, in biomedicine, uh, all these biomedical approaches that people spend fortunes trying to get somewhere with their kids and themselves and actually not succeeding. So we're gonna talk about that as well. But first, Sammy, would you like to talk a little bit about your story and how how you got here because on your website you're very honest about some pretty hardcore things that I know we all struggle with but hardly anybody talk about. Yeah thank you so much Ninka I'm just so honored and blessed to be here and uh, I, I love sharing my story because I believe that when we are open and vulnerable and honest we help others heal and I think that's critical if I can touch one person today, then I feel I've done my job. Um, you know, I always say I came out of the room with depression, anxiety, lots of OCD, um, lots of panic, lots of, you know, this, this thing that we deal with, this frenetic energy that we feel like we can't seem to get away from, that was always present. Um, also disordered eating and body image issues run in my family. I mean, and that's, you know, we always say that's kind of the first clue to chemistry, right? To the epigenetics of what can be going on in your own story uh, by looking at your family. And you, you made a great point. Now, the symptoms and the manifestation might be different, but the chemistry is often very similar uh, as it goes from generation to generation, unless uh, you know, we, you know, we get in there and, and we really see our story for what it is. I prefer to use that terminology because I think our stories are powerful and we all have stories of, of brokenness and, and heartache uh, and trauma and abuse. That's a big part of what we're going to talk about today as well. Um, but there's a beauty in that. There's a beauty in the ability to see that and kind of stop that pattern that tends to manifest throughout the generations, again, we call that epigenetics. Um, so I started using food for emotional support at a very young age, um, as I shared things running in my family. I remember being five years old and uh, binging on cupcakes at a birthday party for a friend. Uh, and as I got older, it just kind of got worse and worse and worse. Now I realize, wow, yeah, my gut was a mess. And, uh, you know, I am under methylated and there's a copper uh, dysmetabolism that tends to run in my family as well as some, some other biochemical issues that I'm sure you've spoken about. And, you know, your, your listeners are very familiar with if you are but familiar we with we have to talk about that as well because I we have to just assume that people don't know this because it's so strange when you say binge eating and OCD and this disordered eating depression the chemistry behind it and then you say methylation you say copper issues mm -hmm. how are they related can we shoot a a, a bit of knowledge in in the mix or you know because that we tend to think oh it's because of family trauma it's em we're eating emotional eating or it's it's cultural it's society but there's actually a missing link there could you clarify a bit what that is because that's so fascinating too yes thank you Ninka, and, and you're correct um 
I think it's important for you know the new listeners to understand. So all of those things are relevant. Trauma and abuse is relevant. However, there's always a biochemical link when we're talking about disordered eating. So I mentioned under a condition called undermethylation. So methylation is crucial, crucial to every body system that we have. Um, and under methylation, our bodies are not making the methyl groups to support neurotransmitters, enzymes, and hormones. Um, and so we often see what we consider, you know, the symptoms of like low serotonin and low dopamine, because we don't have those methyl groups to methylate those important neurotransmitters. And those important neurotransmitters have a big part or, or are a big aspect of disordered eating and the ability to kind of control that, uh, I guess, addictive tendency, if you will. Um, so that is really key. Methylation, excuse me, is really key in any, um, in any disordered eating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you didn't know that that can be fixed with a nutritional approach, then we'll get to that. But back to when you were five years old, before you found out, you had to go through a lot through your teenage years and your younger years to try and figure out what this is all about. So before even knowing anything about the background or understanding yourself and your body, what did you go through with these underlying biochemical problems that you didn't realize that you had? Yeah, I, I just, my childhood was very dark. And, um, I, you know, I'm just being honest, I, I had, as I mentioned, I shared, um, you know, I really struggled with depression, I was suicidal at different points in my life. Um, you know, the, the fatigue was always pretty elevated, even as a child, I had a lot of digestive issues, I struggled with my weight, that's why I was always dieting, right? Um, because I felt like I had to be a certain size to be accepted. Um, and I had a lot of skin issues. So that's another symptom that something is amiss, uh, uh, usually a digestive disorder. But from an emotional perspective, I just felt like I didn't fit in. I had a lot of anxiety around being around people. Um, I know many of your listeners can relate to that. Um, and I just felt very lonely. And like, I didn't fit in. I was very awkward in school. Um, I had, um, after my first MMR shot, when I was, uh, you know, very small, usually those are given around 15 months, I lost my hearing. Um, I became deathly ill after that. So that's another piece of my puzzle in that, you know, there are these environmental factors. Of course, there's the chemistry that we'll get more into, but there's also the environmental factors that can impact our chemistry and shift it in a way that we don't want it to be. So I had hearing aids, right? And when back then in the 80s and 90s, they were huge. They were not cool different colors like they are today. So, and then it also affected my eyesight. So here I am, the small child trying to fit in, oh. big old hearing aids, you know, and I just constantly was paralyzed with fear and panic. I had a lot of intrusive mm -hmm. thoughts and I just, I, I just didn't want to live. Um, and that was very much present throughout my childhood, my teenage years. And I didn't actually figure out the chemistry aspect until I was in my early thirties. So it was a long journey for me. And how did you diet? And I know at some point you got you became a vegan, and that was disastrous. Which is it, which it basically is for everybody, but particularly for the undermethylated, which means all autism families. Yes. But for you, how did you diet? How did you cope with these um, dark thoughts and the body issues throughout your youth and your twenties? Yeah, that's a great question. I. Um, got in with a group of people that were very extreme in their veganism. And, you know, I don't, I don't have anything against a, a vegan plant-based diets. So I just want to make sure that I, that I preface that. Um, but as you shared, Ninka, for me being undermethylated and how folates impact us um, and how we need animal protein, it's, a, it's actually a healing food for us. It was a disaster. So I became extremely thin. And of course, back then, I thought that was the coolest thing ever, being a size zero or a size two. I couldn't be small enough. 
Um, but my hair started to fall out. <clears throat> my depression got even worse. The anxiety got even worse. And I was so extreme in my thinking. Um, you know, I kind of got in with this raw vegan group where you can't cook your food over like 117 degrees. So supposedly this helps preserve enzymes in the food. And that works for some things, not for everything. Of course, cooking actually can be beneficial for certain foods. Yeah. Um, but I did this for three and a half years. So you can imagine I was very thin. Um, I was emotionally erect because it just exacerbated. I was eating a lot of copper and high folate foods. So that exacerbated my condition that I didn't know about. Um, and it just set me into this spiral. And I was living in San Francisco at the time. And I tell you, I there were a couple of times where I was on the Golden Gate Bridge really thinking about jumping off. Obviously, I never did that. Um, but I got to the point where I was standing there and thinking, I just, I don't want to live anymore. I don't want to do this. This is not, this is not the life I want for myself. But again, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, this is the best diet in the world. So mm -hmm. I, I wasn't making the connection between diet and how I was, how I was feeling in my body. And how does it feel for someone who thinks, well, I'm on this diet, whatever you're eating, basically, um, and you think, well, it's supposed to be healthy, bone broth is supposed to be healthy, juices are supposed to be healthy, fermented food, loads of salads, raw uh, vegetables. How does it feel and how did it feel physically in your body that's a sign that the diet is off biochemically when it comes to methylation and copper? Um, and folate intolerance and how does it feel inside like this depression because I remember I, I, the same thing with me I had aggression that I couldn't figure out why do I go down the street and I hate people so much I'm fantasizing about shooting people yes. Mm -hmm. that, so how did it that was in my teenage years similar situation without you we have the same chemistry but what did it feel like for you physically and emotionally so that people can recognize it yeah thank you that's a good uh, a, a very good question and I want to preface that with saying you know my pattern was to I, I was what's considered a non-purging bulimic so I would use exercise and I would use extreme dieting, usually in the form of green juices for weeks on end. And then I would go on a big binge with whatever I wanted. It didn't matter what it was. It was, my thing was Oreo cookies and Ben and Jerry's ice cream. You know, I could, yeah. <laughs> I could eat a whole package of those and a couple, you know, pints of, of Ben and Jerry's. Um, but inside it, there was, and now for me, I always turned on myself. Some people, yes, there is that rage, there, there is that outward aggression. Um, and I'm not saying that wasn't there, but for me, it was constantly beating myself up. I yeah. felt paralyzed. I was, I, I, I just, it, everything was fearful. I'd wake up with anxiety. I would wake up thinking, oh my gosh, I, I don't know if I can even face the day today. Um, mm -hmm. And that would send me down another spiral, but I would go through periods of feeling okay. And that's where that binging I felt was helping me. Um, I also did a lot of coffee enemas and I would feel relief from that because obviously there was a release there. But then a couple of days later, I was kind of back to feeling crappy again. So yes, there were all these, always these thoughts inside, these ruminations inside my brain that I'm not good enough. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not skinny enough and I'm not worthy of love. And um, I need to do something to fix myself. But if I just you know, change my hair or my body or my clothing, somehow things are going to be okay. If I find an amazing man, mm -hmm. um, somehow that relationship is going to transform me and I'm going to be fine. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, none of that is, is ever true for, for any of us, really. Um, but I think that constant rumination, you can call it OCD, um, the constant thoughts of harming myself, um, they were always present in the background, no matter what I was doing. I'd be out on a date with a man and I'd be counting the calories of the salad in front of me <laughs> in my mind. Like, oh my gosh, I wonder if I, you know, should I eat this or, or should I not eat this? So what is he going to think of me? There's always that constant rumination. Yeah. What was a turning point for you with all this? Because this was in your 20s with the, the vegan 
Yeah, this was in my 20s and, um, you know, kind of, yeah, it, 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 it kind of went mid to, to later 20s. And then I started adding more animal products and I started feeling a little bit better. But in my early 30s was when I um, hooked up with Dr. Albert Mansa and started that process because I'm also a patient in addition to, um, you know, partnering with him on, you know, in, in business. Yes. Why is it? Because this is something that most vegans feel when they start to eat meat. Why is it that animal-based protein is a healing food for us autism moms, for autistic children, and for someone like you? Yeah, um, you know, animal proteins create, or excuse me, contain the methyl donors that we require, remember I talked about methyl groups earlier and how they attach to things and methylate them. It's like the right kind of oil for your automobile. You know, you wouldn't put um, diesel in, uh, you know, a, a, a brand new Toyota, for example, um, that would be the wrong fuel. So we need the right fuel. So that's, that's why I wanna encourage everyone that's listening to think about what is the right fuel for you and your chemistry. Uh, so protein, has abundance of amino acids, also other nutrients, and those methyl donors are abundant. Those amino acids, specifically methionine, are uh, abundant in animal protein. They're not abundant in plant-based proteins, and also our body synthesizes those amino acids from animal-based proteins much more readily than they do from, from plants, because there's a lot of challenges with things like phytic acid and your body's ability to break some of these things down that can attach to nutrients in the body and, and block their absorption. We don't want that. We want something that is readily absorbed similar you know, to our bodies. Um, and that's why animal-based proteins are really a, a superfood for us. And conversely, with the folates, the salads, the juices that you lived on uh, throughout your, your 20s, for someone who doesn't know, what is it that they do that isn't the opposite of healing? For, because it's known to be healing foods, right? Yeah, the thing about folates is interesting. Yes, uh, folate is um, a nutrient that is important. Um, absolutely, especially in the first trimester of pregnancy, uh, it, it is important. Um, thereafter, uh, I mean, that's another show, but um, basically we, with regard to any form of folate, and this is not just folate in food, this is also folic acid in supplements, especially methylated folate, which is you know very popular and often prescribed by practitioners. What happens is we've got a nucleus every cell has a nucleus and that's where all of our instructions are made. That's where our DNA lies. So what happens with folates and folic acid is they go into the nucleus and they strip away 10 times more than they donate outside of the nucleus. So that's a cytoplasm. So that's problematic. Oftentimes when under methylators start something like methylfolate or, or even regular folic acid, um, they might feel good for a while. Usually we see around the three month mark, they feel pretty darn good. And then three months hit and all of a sudden they bottom out. Well, guess what's happened? That folate that donated some methyl outside the cell, the nucleus of the cell inside is now starting to strip away those important methyl groups that we need. So that's, that's why that is problematic for us. And that's why vegan and plant-based diets where we're eating a lot of um, high folate foods, you know, people juicing spinach, I did that a lot. Um, there's also, you know, there's so many other high folate foods, but that's what's going on cellularly and chemically in the body when we eat those in abundance. And so when you, and that's just, I, I whenever I talk to someone, I want that mentioned because I still don't understand why it is not something that everyone knows in this community. You know, whenever I check a web page where someone's dealing with autism, parents or children, I don't see it still now. It's been, you've been talking about it for now, what, eight years, 10 years? Uh, for families, more than that. Yeah. And um, Mensa, Dr. Berenzi here in the UK, and it's still not, and, and William Walsh's work as well, just, just not. It's just not getting out there. And 
I cannot understand why and I cannot accept it either. So what happened when you came and you met Mince, I, I'm assuming as a client, were you at the end of your tether and then you found him and what happened? Yeah, that was when I was still living in San Francisco and I had had, um, you know, kind of mentioned the Golden Gate Bridge earlier. Um, I had had an incident where, you know, I was walking along the Golden Gate Bridge and and um, I, I don't know why I didn't jump. I was really ready to jump. It was an interesting time. I think God just kind of spoke to me in that moment and said, you know, there's there's a better way. There's another way. And and one of my medical journals, I found an article by Dr. William Walsh, who wrote the book Nutrient Power, um, who's kind of the impetus for the work that we do today. And that's how I found Mensa Medical, uh, Dr. Mensa and Dr. Bowman. And um, I got on. It was it was it was amazing. I called that same. So this was over the weekend. I called that Monday and they were able to get me in that week. I got on a plane. I went to Chicago. They're just outside of Chicago here in the States. And um, I was able to see them right away and start the healing process. And so what was the healing process for you? Because copper was involved, uh, methylation involved. And what, because this is kind of the other way around that we want to, we want people to look at, okay, let's fix the foundation first. So what, what did he do and how long did it take for you to feel better? Yeah, I like the question about time because mm -hmm. we live in a world of quick fixes. And I know when we're hurting and when we're struggling, it's hard to be patient. But for me, it took about a year and a half to come full circle. And even thereafter, you know, I can, and I still do to this day. I mean, it's been yeah, like 10 years. Um, and I'm still noticing things. I'm still shifting as we get older, things change mm -hmm. naturally, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I my diet was already really good um, because I was already a practitioner. I understood I had gotten out of the whole vegan thing and, you know, that, that helped. Um, but really what was extraordinary for me was understanding, as you shared, Minka, that my copper levels were very high. Copper toxicity is very common in autism, also common in, in women as well because of the relationship between estrogen and copper. Um, so my copper levels were very, very high. Uh, yes, the methylation was pretty severe. Um, uh, pyroluria is something that is another condition or pyrrole disorder, uh, a d double deficiency of zinc and vitamin B6 and an intolerance to omega-3 fatty acids. Um, that had been present earlier when I was a child. Of course, I can't prove that because we didn't have the testing we have now. Um, but that's also a part of my story, having challenges with zinc and, and so forth. So um, I met with them. I started you know, my treatment protocol. I adjusted my diet because the diet needs to be in sync with the, the nutrients with your chemistry. So low folate, uh, you know, even though I had added animal protein, um, I was still eating a lot of high folate foods. So low folate, low copper. I started my, you know, specific nutrients for me and my chemistry. And I got to tell you that first month, my depression went away. It was really that fast. Yeah. Now uh, my lithium was also pretty much non-existent. So I know that was part of it, but um, it was pretty extraordinary how quickly things started to shift, but the full effect took about a year and a half. And did you uh, get on lithium orotate as well? Like in I did. Yes, I got um, on it right away. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, we checked that with the hair analysis and um, uh, yeah, lithium. I mean, in, in the beginning, that was one of the nutrients that saved my life. Yeah. Yeah. For me as well. That, that, that was amazing too. I'm curious with your eating now, because when we have this extreme way of eating and it's in such it's been practiced for so long mm -hmm. and being so hard on ourselves and never feeling good enough where are you at with your eating and your relationship with your body now because it's something that can take a long time to heal if it ever fully heals sometimes i think well maybe we're using that extremism just it, with the 
in a better way, you know, by being extremely careful with being diligent with our, our healing foods. But how do you obtain balance and how do you eat today? Can you drink almond um, milk? Can you do folates more? As in, can, you, can you get more of those foods into your diet now than you could in the beginning? Absolutely. Um, that, yeah, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm so, this is a great conversation. I love this because we're, we're touching on different points that I think are very confusing for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so I'll just uh, tackle that last question, Inka. Um, uh, do I have high folate foods once in a while? Certainly. I don't eat avocados every day like I used to. Oh. Um, but once in a while, um, I might have some, I don't really I honestly, I don't eat out. I prefer to eat my own food that I know is healthy. In addition to uh, our own chemistry, we've got to worry about the environment now and the chemicals that they're adding uh, to our, our soil and our food. Um, but yes, I, I will eat those foods once in a while. Once copper is normalized, so, so basically copper toxicity is an inability to effectively metabolize copper. It's, it's, it's not... Um, it's something that once we get the, the, the body in motion and things working um, and we get normalized, again, we can have chocolate once in a while. We can, you know, we can do the nuts and seeds from time to time and it's really not a big deal. Um, the reason why I choose, and it's a conscious choice, not to eat a lot of those foods is almonds, um, as you know, they're very popular because people are getting away from milk. Mm -hmm. So what, what happens when that, you know, when something becomes popular, we see a, a surge in the market of crops that, again, are sprayed with glyphosate and other chemicals. And that's my big concern with a lot of these foods, specifically grains, is, is how they are sprayed, the chemicals that they're utilized. But if you can find almonds that aren't sprayed, if you can find organic almonds and you have almond milk or almond butter once in a while, that's totally fine. That's that. That's not an issue. Um, you know, when it comes to disordered eating and my um, kind of my uh, my journey and my story with it, I, I want to be completely honest. It does take time. It yeah. is a process that does require being gentle with yourself, um, uh, patience with yourself. The whole time I was going through that year and a half of healing, while well, on my initial Mensa protocol. I was binging. I want to be honest about that. I was still doing this, this, you know, this game with myself where I would starve and then, you know, go on a binge. And, but, you know, I learned over time as my chemistry changed and as I started to become more comfortable in my body, I learned over time that this isn't serving me. And what am I really doing in this situation? And my turning point came when I was at the grocery store and I was going through my usual routine of Ben and Jerry's Oreo cookies. Um, and I remember I opened the freezer door and I'm looking at this, you know, I, I remember this one I liked, it was called Chubby Hubby. Um, <laughs> I know. Yeah. Uh, and um, it had like, like peanut butter filled pretzels, I think, and like chocolate and all this anyway. Um, and I thought, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm staring inside the, the freezer door and I'm like, why am I doing, why do I need this? I feel fine. I don't, I'm actually not even hungry right now. So it was really a light bulb moment for me in the middle of the store. Yeah. And I'm like, and so I put everything back. I'd never done that before. It was always just automatic. You know, we kind of get on this track of, okay, I'm triggered right now. I'm going to go to the store and I'm going to do this. And this is my self-soothing, right? Mm. Um, that, was, that was my turning point. But, but something I, I think is really critical, and, and if it's all right, if I share this, I think people misunderstand eating disorders or disordered yeah. eating, however you want to word that. Um, still to this day, uh, you know, there's a, there's a thinking that nutrient deficiencies are, are, you know, the cause of the eating disorder, because, you know, you know, when you're, when you're uh, eating foods that, um, excuse me, if you're going on binges and so forth, and, and you're starving yourself, yes, you're going to be depleted of nutrients, but we always going back to chemistry, we have to look, well, what's the underlying chemistry that's actually precipitating this? What are the antecedents that are creating a, a challenge for this individual? 
And, and, and looking at that, looking at it through that lens, I think is really, really important. We have to look at the genetic, epigenetic, and of course the societal and environmental factors. Um, uh, because things like, you know, for example, anorexia, um, that's severe zinc deficiency and under methylation. We, we know that is a key, those are key features, excuse me, um, of uh, anorexia specifically. Um, bulimia is, is I'm it sorry. the same? Bulimia is the same? So, so bulimia is not always zinc deficiency. Uh, bulimia, it, it often is. Um, but, but yeah, we, we see methylation, we see over and under methylation with bulimia. Um, we can see pyrrole disorder with bulimia. And I don't want to forget to talk about the gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. um, gut inflammation is a huge piece of eating disorders. And I wish I had known this very early on. It would have saved me a lot of, of heartache. So you had asked earlier about, you know, what were some of the things you did in terms of, you know, your starting place? Um, looking at my gut and the health of my GI tract was, was, was a big, because uh, I'd never done that before, really in any depth. I had not done that before. I think people don't really know, know how important it is. It's like, it's like villages inside of you of different types of people who need different types of food to thrive. Yes. And so any extreme eating will deplete some of these tribes of people who are there to protect you against the enemy coming into the village. And that's something I really had to take on board when I met my Mensa here in, in the UK, that some need bananas, some need apples, some need pears, some need, I don't know, flax seeds, whatever it is. So that is how we are designed to roam around and have different types of food and different types of food at different times during the year. And so if we eat this mono uh, diet where we eat the same thing all the time and all the year long, that's a problem. And then we have these, uh, when we feed the, these bad guys in the village by giving ourselves too much sugar and bread, we feed candida and all these um, intruders and they will call for more of that food. So that's how we need to think about it. And, and I love the idea of, so I don't know what you did. I'm so curious about what you did. What we did was microdosing it in the beginning. So we had microdoses of all the, the nutrients. I even now I have a powder of 200 different herbs that oh. I add to our food. And that in itself will re-educate the gut. It doesn't take a lot of different vegetables. So you can actually cheat like that in the beginning. So I'm curious, what did you do? Because I'm, I'm guessing you were afraid of carbs like me and afraid of potatoes, which the gut actually also really need. What did you do? Yeah, yeah, I'm glad that you shared that because the microdosing is really key, the starting slow um, and working our way up. That is a key feature of a nutrient therapy program. Um, and I know for me, I did, uh, you know, a lot of stool testing, some urine testing. Um, here, I like to do GI maps with my patients to really see top to bottom what the microbiome is doing. Um, I had a lot of yeast, which makes sense with all of my disordered, you know, binge eating. Um, I also had SIBO. Um, and then my secretory IgA was low. And uh, when that's low, we know definitively um, you know, that leaky gut is, is going to be present, um, that mucosal lining has been um, damaged in a way, but that can be repaired. So um, in addition to my nutrients, I also started a program to get rid of the yeast, uh, you know, get, get rid of the bacteria. Um, and that's to your point, yes, we use botanicals for that. It could be anything from oil of oregano, um, garlic can be helpful depending on the individual. Some people are um, highly um, uh, allergic to, to garlic, uh, therapeutic use of garlic. I mean, not, not just garlic that you get in your kitchen and take that, that doesn't tend to be as effective um, as something like Allison, but mm -hmm. a, a wide variety of botanicals, rotating those botanicals. Um, uh, uh, the thing with, or the challenge with antibiotics is they stay in one place and they strip everything out. Of course, long-term use of botanicals can also strip away the good guys as well. So we want to remove what is, <clears throat> excuse me, 
what is overgrown, what is pathogenic or opportunistic that's turning pathogenic. And then we want to repair and replace like what, what you're doing with a variety of herbs. Um, short chain fatty acids are also wonderful because I agree with you, Ninka, um, you know, with regard to our food supply all over the world now and what's especially uh, happened since COVID started, um, we're not getting the nutrients that we need from our food. So I think these supplemental sources, whether it's, it's, it's herbs that act like as prebiotics um, and, and also uh, probiotics and postbiotics, these things are all really helpful to help heal the microbiome, seal that gut lining. Um, and then guess what? Our nutrients become um, uh, easier to absorb. The body takes everything in that it needs and it really starts to heal. What's postbiotics? Yeah, so a postbiotic would be something like, um, uh, you know, like a, a butyrate supplement. I consider okay. that to, to be to be you know in that category. Um, and there are things that are considered kind of prebiotics that I kind of put in the postbiotic category. Some fiber-based powders, um, but. Uh, anything that's going to support the gut immune system, um, I, I like um, uh, some some mucosal products that contain those um, immunoglobulins that support, you know, again that lining that is permeable. It helps to seal that off, and so I put those in that category as well. So for like to to just round that one up, um, how do we eat well without? extremism and what foods do we need to basically say hey it's just not part of our lives not today not later because i know for me there are some some ones that's just it, it doesn't happen in our family uh, what foods do we need to say goodbye to in autism families if we want to thrive long term yeah i i love this question too because this this brings me to well what is food um, what we've been told is food is not food. You know, food is, is, is any substance that nourishes us, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sorry, but even Ezekiel bread, that's not food. I know no. they've got some sprouting in there, and, but yeah, not food. Oat milk, I'm sorry, is not food. So the three big triggers are going to be gluten, dairy, sugar. Well, most people know that. But again, with food marketing and all the claims that are made these days, it's really hard to differentiate between you know, what, what really that is, right? Um, so I would say anything that has the ability to rot, <laughs> yeah. meaning a whole food is again, in line with your chemistry, um, is, is inappropriate food. It's anything that um, is, is actually going to provide nutrients to your body that's going to be easy to digest is it usually does not come in a box. It's something that you want to incorporate in your diet. Even if you don't know your chemistry, even if this is the first time you're listening in uh, and you're not sure where to start, just that simple act of focusing more on whole foods can be very, very healing. And now you say um, oat milk is not a food. And I know that many people do use oat milk instead of dairy. I would like you to touch on the, the big traps when you let go of dairy and gluten, because you can then actually add on more problems with copper and um, yes, and with intolerances and like cross contamination, because oats is really gluten isn't it oh yeah oh yeah and i tell people all the time hey you know glyphosate it's 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 an endocrine disruptor toxic substance it's everywhere now all over the world we can't get away from it no um and it's used in every process every every aspect of growing um up into the end uh, it's used as a desiccant to dry out oats so they can sit in these huge vats and, and await processing and packaging. You don't want that in your body. So, and I mean, it's basically just sugar water. So you're just basically drinking all of these chemicals yeah. in the sugar water. Um, and that's, you know, that that's that's problematic. Um, I'm sorry, what was the, the next part of your yeah, question? So I apologize. Because we do then add on more problems. If we say, okay, yeah, thank you. Instead, yes, of, instead of dairy, we're just gonna do, 
liters of almond milk and cashew milk yes. and oat milk and whatever. And what happens when we do that? That's bad yes. for autism families and moms and depression and anxiety. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for getting me back on track here. Um, so the challenge is you're exacerbating your chemistry when you're adding in these foods that yes, are often high in copper. So nuts and seeds, almost all of them, most all of them are going to be very high copper foods. So when you take uh, milk, which we know unless it's raw milk from you know a, a, a local farm, um, and you then replace that for you know again almond or oat or whatever, you're not only eating the chemicals that are involved in that processing, you're also eating a high copper food and that can exacerbate chemistry. A lot of these are also fortified. We often don't, you know, when we grab for whatever that carton is at the grocery store, we don't look and see, oh, wow, I see synthetic vitamin D on here, which is yeah. vitamin D too. I see folate. Wow, folate's yeah. in here as well. So we don't want anything that's going to be fortified. Now they had you know, they, they were trying to do a good thing way back in the 40s and 50s when they started fortifying foods. Um, but it, it unfortunately, it created a lot of the challenge or contributed to a lot of the challenges that we're having today. So we don't want anything that's going to trigger chemistry, pea proteins, you know, pea drinks, you know, again, almonds, cashews, etc. Coconut's okay if you tolerate coconut. Which, um, so if you were to, to pick a protein powder or if you would do any grains, what would that be? What would be the least problematic? I saw the other day someone talking about pumpkin protein powder. Are you a fan or not? Yeah, I don't have a problem. Sometimes those things can go rancid um, in that process. But of course, they're, if it's a protein powder, they're separating the fat, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. um, so some of those things can be okay. Pumpkin seeds also have a decent amount of zinc in them. So that can, you know, they, they are high in copper, but, you know, having that added zinc can be beneficial. So I will often add like sprouted pumpkin seeds or pumpkin seed butter to the protocols that I incorporate. Um, but um, as far as protein powder is concerned, I, I usually recommend things that are more beef-based. Um, yeah. Collagen's okay, it's not a complete protein. But uh, if you go with a company that is, um, you know, sourcing obviously grass-fed cows, those, and, and they have minimal, you know, uh, uh, other ingredients, those are generally safe. I find that people tolerate them. Some people don't, that, that's, a, you know, usually a trigger that there's a gut issue, but that's usually the, uh, the direction that I go in. And you are not so worried about glutamates then for the collagen and the protein powder or what? what would yeah, you say? That's, that's another good question. So I think there's a lot of confusion in terms of food-based sources um, versus something that you're going to get like an MSG or something like that, which again, we know is very inflammatory to the brain. So yeah. when we're talking about things like bone broth and things like, yes, some of these protein powders that have uh, and an animal base to them, a beef base to them. I find that usually they're fairly well tolerated. Um, and I don't think that they have uh, the, the levels that we're concerned about in terms of the impact that that has on the brain. Um, and again, I want to also preface that if you're doing this in conjunction with and working with a practitioner that knows what they're doing, but doing this in conjunction with a nutrient therapy program, um, I, I rarely find issues with that. That's awesome. That's so awesome. That's really good news because I know people have been staying away from that. And it is a healing food as well, you know, and mm -hmm. it's easy. I want to ask you something. I don't know if you've heard about it, but we have we have the seasonal trends and um, the trend this season is root cause protocol. I don't know if you've heard of it. Oh, yeah. But it's been, okay, now copper toxicity is no longer existing, which is something that in our community we've seen the devastating effects of. And now of, apparently you need to take copper and stop taking um, vitamin D, K2, and uh, yeah, a lot of, lot of different interesting things but since you know about root cause protocol for those who are into that at the moment, I would love to hear your take on it because I tend to ask the experts about this because, yeah, different opinions about it. 
Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's an important question. Something else they advocate advocate is uh, oyster oyster shell uh, mm -hmm. capsules to get zinc, which um, high in copper. Uh, yeah, but there's other challenges with that. Um, mostly, our waters are so terribly polluted with chemicals and medications, and um, that's that's another show. Um, you know, I. I think it's great if a program works for someone, but for my and our patient population, we're talking about autism, we're talking about yeah. women that are struggling um, with copper issues and PMDD and you know so many PCOS and so many of the challenges that I work with in my clinic. Um, it's a very uh, inappropriate protocol. Mm -hmm. um, um, nutrients are powerful and they are absolutely appropriate. We know that vitamin D works. We've seen through COVID the impact that a lot of these nutrients, vitamin A, D, C, zinc have on the immune system, um, but also the impact that they have on the brain and brain chemistry. Um, my, I get a lot of people that um, have had really unfavorable reactions to these types of protocols um, because they're, they don't know what their chemistry is. Exactly. And they're unaware that they probably have a copper problem or there might be a methylation challenge. Mm -hmm. So that's always my, uh, my concern. Um, you know, I, I'm never going to disparage, uh, you know, a, a, a protocol. I think, again, if something works for you, that is great. But again, in our community, please be careful because some of these things can be, we've seen people end up in the hospital taking copper supplements and eating a lot of organ meats, which are high in folate and copper. So um, we just have to be careful. And um, again, please work with someone that, that understands um, these chemistries and understands how to treat things like autism. Yeah, and the families, because we know that if you have issues with copper, which would be in undetected, the, the reason why these things can be a bit problematic, yeah, I get it's a, it's a benefit that there's a lot for free there. You can download the guide and you can get started for free. But if you don't know if there's an issue with copper, these are the moms who give birth and they go and kill themselves. They go it, it, from the hospital in their gown and they jump. We've seen that they, yeah. they jump from the hospital roof. Mm -hmm. And so it's not something to take lightly. These these metal dysregulations it's not something you would want to do on your own at all you've got no. to work with someone who, who can test you if you want to do these kinds of things uh, yeah i'm glad you said that can i just add one thing to yeah. that? Is yeah, that okay yeah. um regarding copper and uh you know uh, you know paranoia and extreme postpartum depression that's copper toxicity if you're struggling with that just so you know um, and I know that um, this one, um, you know, protocol, this one, you know, community, they say that you actually need more copper, that zinc is, mm -hmm. is, is inflammatory, which is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, and advocate, again, don't take zinc supplements because you're, you're going to reduce copper. Well, that's not actually true. I did, I did a whole show with that with Dr. Judith Bowman about zinc and copper because I wanted people to understand what are the mechanisms of action? How do zinc and copper actually, how do they work together? How mm -hmm. do they function in the body? We need both of them, um, absolutely. But I, I'm so glad that you brought that up because you know we see women drowning their children in the bathtub that happened several years ago here in Texas in the United States. Um, and that woman is still in a facility. And I, you know, I, I feel for her because if we could just test her chemistry yeah. and, and see that, you know, her copper is really elevated, uh, we, we, you know, we could have helped her. Um, but to your point, yes, this is, this is really something that's very troubling to see. So please be careful. We, we need to link to that. You have to send me the link for that sure. podcast and I'll link to it in the description, in the description for this podcast as well. Yeah, One you. thing I wanted to ask you as well uh, is PCOS and endometriosis, because you do, you, that's one of your other expertises, and it's something that a lot of moms are dealing with as well. What's that about, and how do you, 
approach it. Is there anything these moms can do on their own with their diet? Absolutely. Or do they need to work with someone? Yeah, I mean, PCOS, I definitely, if you want to treat that condition or endometriosis as a whole, I do recommend working with someone. But right now, today, you can do, um, there's so much you can do on your own with diet. As I spoke about a, a bit ago, stick to whole foods. Um, we know copper is also a component of these conditions. Gut microbiome issues are huge in both PCOS and endometriosis. I have yet to meet a woman that did not have a dysregulated gut microbiome um, with these conditions. So that's where I think it's important to have help. Um, you know, when copper is very, very high, as you mentioned, Ninka, um, you know, starting to take like high doses of zinc on your own, very bad idea. You can have a detox response that can really send you over the edge. So please be Because careful. of copper dumping, right? Yes. Correct. Yeah. So I think, yeah, so right now, um, again, just focus on those whole foods, making sure you have animal protein. These conditions don't do well on vegan diets. I'm sorry to tell you, I wanna be honest about that. But eating regularly, having protein, uh, good quality, you know, grass-fed beef, organic, uh, chicken, turkey, so forth, uh, with meals is important to balance blood sugar because that's also uh, very dysregulated in both of these conditions. So I think those are things that you could do right now to start the healing process. That's so awesome. Oh, it's incredible. You're just so awesome. Um, if you were to say, just sum up the most important things for you to tell moms with autistic children who recognize themselves in some of the things that you've been struggling with or talked about today, what are the five top messages that you want to bring across to this population of extremely amazing moms who also they work so hard they're struggling so much. What would you say to them if they were in the room with you today? Yeah, I'd say you're doing great. I'd say, I know this has been a hard journey, but healing is always possible. Mm -hmm. I want you to know that. You know, diet culture tells us, eat this, don't eat that. That was really common when I was growing up. You know, fat was the enemy. Uh, everything had to be low carb, and but of course high in sugar. And now we have this anti-diet culture that says, eat whatever you want, even if it's inflammatory, even if it triggers health problems and inflames your gut in the name of body positivity. Mm -hmm. So what's happening in these situations, of course, there's the chemistry aspect. There are a lot of layers here, but if I can just give you, you know, and I'll try and round this with five things. The first is listen to yourself. You know all the answers. Um, a good practitioner will draw that out of you. A good practitioner will know how to listen. Mm -hmm. But just know that your body is always talking to you. Yeah. And um, I think that's really critical uh, that, that we always listen. So, you know, paleo might be great for you, might not be. AIP, keto, all these things, um, they may or may not be good for you, but just listen, see what feels good in your body. Mm -hmm. um, I can't stress enough also just finding a practitioner that comes from a place of really heartfelt compassion and understanding for all that we're talking about. Um, you need support. I, you know, Mink has created a, an amazing community. You've got wonderful support if you're a part of her community. Um, we all need support. And um, we all need someone that knows how to guide us, that has you know, often been where we are and can help lead us in that direction. Um, regarding food, it doesn't have to be, um, I know food, gosh, it's such a trigger for us these days, yeah. right? But I think the one thing I wanna say, and you know, I, I mentioned this before, um, just go to the store and start getting, you know, kind of cozy with the whole foods, the produce department. If you're not sure about something, ask. Um, I've got a great produce manager at the store that I go to and, and, and also with my local farmers. So, so wherever you are in the world, check out your local farmer, have developed those relationships. Um, and that leads me into the other thing. If, you know, if, if you have children and you're listening in, which I know many of you do, um, make them a part of the process, you know, bring them into the kitchen, 
take them to the farm with you, help them understand this, this is where this comes from. This mm -hmm. is how this is made. I think as, as much as we can bring families into the process and working together, we create harmony, we create healing. Um, uh, it breaks my heart when I see a family that's disjointed. Maybe one parent's like, I'm not doing that. I'm gonna keep eating all the inflammatory foods in front of my autistic child. The other parents trying to create change and, and cook healthy meals, that doesn't work. No. Uh, that never works. So I, I would say as much as you can bring everyone into the fold, um, you know, get in the kitchen together, learn some new skills. I think all of that is, is, um, is, is really important. So I, I think I touched on five, but correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, you, did. <laughs> you did. That's amazing. But would you say, because there are two things I think are the most pressing in these families, one is the broken metabolism. And if you have had long-term exclusion diets yes. or you've been overperforming, which you do as an autism mom, and you have cortisol all over the place, mm -hmm. you will have some issues with the broken metabolism. Can we fix that? Yes. If we oh, count absolutely. calories, if we fast and keep on doing those things, that's bound to be difficult. And is it linked to picky eating in our children? How, what's the best way of fixing metabolism? Because my feeling is that sometimes we actually need to gain weight to, to yes. get the body to a safe spot. Yes. yes. What do you think? Yeah, uh, love this question. Um, and when I was saying yes, I was saying, yes, you can heal, you can yeah. fix that. Um, but I'll, I'll be honest, um, I did gain weight when I was going through my healing protocol, my body, was regulating, it was normalizing. You know, if you think of your body as your computer and, you know, nutrients and all these foods that you're eating and incorporating as the software to make your hard drive and your hardware run, run optimally. Um, uh, it's, we need to let go of the counting and the weighing. I don't do any of that when I'm working with, with you know, the people that I serve. I want them to throw out the scale, um, it's just going to create more anxiety and more overwhelm, right? Because yeah. you're going to say, oh my gosh, I gained two pounds, but I've been starving myself. I've been doing so good. Mm -hmm. The body doesn't like that. The body is never, ever going to respond well. So yes, you can extremes heal. Extremes to exactly. extremes. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. But no extremes, you're not going to heal with extremes. No. So I'm glad that you brought that up. It's really, really critical. And so how much do women need to eat because mm. it, it's I hate calorie counting and it's everywhere and most of these apps out there where you are counting your calories and you're fixing your metabolism right now I'm testing the lumen app and it's it mm. it makes me so angry because it's all below it's between 1500 and 2000 it's fat restricting I can see because they're basing it on science and I'm just, ah, is there nowhere out there where people can just relax and fix their metabolism in a way where it can be monitored as well so they can see, hey, my body's actually working now. How much food do we need? Don't you think that women generally under eat? Yes, yes. And guess what, ladies? We need more protein as we get older. <laughs> yeah. We need more protein as we get older. I have to have protein with every meal. Yeah. So you know, we know that hormonal decline is, it's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, if you're 20 and you're listening, um, you know, you're, you're probably doing okay. Uh, you still need protein. Um, but I think for me, this comes back to relationship to self. Yes. Because diets and anti-diets and everything in between AIP, keto, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, they, they trickle into all facets of our relationship with food yeah. and relationship to ourselves. Yeah. Um, so I always encourage people that I'm working with and that I'm serving to let that go mm -hmm. uh, and to realize that um, you don't need to count calories. You don't need to weigh grams of protein and so forth. You don't need to go super high fat and very, you know, very low to non-existent carb. Um, which is going to ruin your microbiome anyway, um, or the mono dieting, like the carnivore that you mentioned, Minka, oh. where all you eat is meat. I have a friend who all she, she did a full year. I don't know how she did it. 
a full year of eating nothing but animal protein. And I was like, wow, I mean, I, I know I couldn't do that. But um, I, I think just you know, get rid of the scales and just know that you will feel nourished. You will feel it in your body and you can check in your body and with your body, you can take a deep breath, hold it, exhale and say, okay, am I, am I hungry in this moment? Yeah. Um, do I need more food? Cause sometimes you just need more food, but I guarantee you my healing. And I see this all the time in the women that I serve. It, it's amazing how, when you get rid of the scales and you stop counting calories and using all the apps that are supposedly based on all this amazing science, right? Um, it's amazing when you let that go, how your body just naturally gets into yeah. balance. So I mentioned, yes, I gained weight. I didn't like it. I fought it. I was angry, but I got to this point where I was like, oh, wow. You know, I've been killing myself in the gym all these years and restricting myself all these years. I'm just going to enjoy all these wonderful, beautiful whole foods. And I did. And guess what? Mm -hmm. My body got back into balance. Um, today, I don't think about, I, I, don't, I just, it doesn't even cross my mind to restrict myself. I just, I get up in the morning. I eat, I have breakfast, I have lunch, I have dinner. If I need a snack, I have a snack. <laughs> I love you. I just, I'm just like, <laughs> I actually love, I love food. That's why I never eat out because I love making my own food, you know, because it's, it's good. It's nourishing and I feel good in my body. And mm -hmm. I just don't care what anyone thinks of me anymore. And I know mm -hmm. that that's, that's difficult, but I, I want to give everyone listening that encouragement. Oh, so beautiful. And don't you think it's, linked to all this picky eating this this oh, so absolutely relationship we have with our own body yes. is transferred over to our children's yes it is most definitely and you know picky eating there's going to be gut microbiome issues that are precipitating the picky eating yeah. so um but but i agree with you ninka um you know i grew up in a household with a parent that really did not like her body i never heard, heard anything um uh, you know, healthy or positive. I know that was transferred onto me. I, 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 you know, this is not a blame at all. I take responsibility for myself. Um, but growing up in that kind of environment, um, that did have an effect on me and it does have an effect on children, a profound effect. So I, I completely agree with that. Well, thank you that there's no doubt that you are needed in this world and I cannot wait to get you into my community and teach people more in smaller groups where we dive into more of their individual chemistry as well and learn from you in a, in a close setting. But for those who just wanna get a, get a hold on you now and find you and read more and find your blogs, um, where can they find you? Yes, thank you, Ninka, and I'm I'm very excited to uh, you know be a part of your community as well. Um, yeah, just go to eat for dot life e a t f o r dot l i f e not dot com. Um, you know, most people at this point say, yeah, you can reach me on Facebook and Instagram. I'm going to say you can't reach me on Facebook and Instagram oh, because good. I decided to get off of them. I I don't agree with what they're doing in the world. So please join me at my website. <laughs> That's so cool. You got to start a course for all of us that needs to get off as well. I hate I just, it. Yeah, it's it just it drives me. See, this is another thing. It drives me crazy. So, um, I uh, I, I encourage limiting uh, social yeah. media if you can. Oh, so no, I, yeah. I do too. <laughs> Thank you so much for your Thank time you, and your heart and your story and your help in this world, Samantha. God bless you. God and bless I cannot you. wait to talk to you again. Likewise. Thank you, my dear. Thank you. Thank you.